Good day, Steve and Rob. First of all, let me thank both of you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Um, I've, I've known Steve for 30 some years and Rob, we just met a few minutes ago. So welcome to uh, this program. And what I'm hoping to do is to share with the audience uh, some of the more current things going on in the instructional systems design or learning experience design world and that encroachment into this thing we call performance improvement or human performance technology stuff. So before we get into the main event here, uh, could both of you take a turn at introducing yourselves to our audience? And Rob, could you go first? Sure. Hey, thanks, Guy. It's good to meet you. Good to meet you. So um, I was a professor. I'm now retired. Um, and up to a couple years ago, um, I was teaching and researching and et cetera in the management information systems in the college of business at, at Boise State University. And so uh, so I'm not exactly from your field of human performance, but uh, we're more on the technology side. But really what I call myself is um, my focus is really with, the, with socio-technical systems. So, I, yeah, I'm a technologist on the one hand, but it's very much on the, on the human, uh, human aspects of that and the organizational aspects. So, so whether it's designing systems to address human and organizational needs, or it's helping students learn to work more effectively in teams, um, you know, it's, it's that, that sort of thing. So, um, and my research actually comes from something way, way back in the, in the past that nobody probably today has ever heard of, which, is, which was called group decision support systems. So way back when. Anyway, I don't want to go that far. I want to be current here. So uh, the type, type of topics I've been teaching are systems analysis, project management, business intelligence, that sort of thing. Um, and much of my research and consulting work has involved computer-supported facilitation. So, so using systems and using facilitation techniques uh, to bringing those together to help teams be more effective um, brainstorming, evaluating, organizing information, etc., using tools to help do that using techniques. So, so back in the day, it was using software to enable group members to input in parallel one minute and then figure out what they were saying in the next minute. Um, it, today, it's overcoming distance barriers uh, to talk and visualize ideas together. And we were really thrown into this with the pandemic, um, but, um, uh, but it's always kind of been there in the past of how do we bridge those, those kind of differences. So over the past 20 years, um, I've been particularly interested in helping groups map and change their business processes. It's kind of that, uh, it's a, a great use of technology and, uh, and uh, facilitation techniques. So um, up until the pan pandemic, we destroyed a lot of reams of butcher paper and post-its. Uh, but working with my partner, Steve, here and uh, some grad students over the past couple of years uh, through the process management lab that we're going to tell you about, um, I think we found a very productive combination of the tools and techniques. So thank you for that. Steve, can you uh, give us an overview of uh, your background in, in this? Sure. Uh, thank you again, Guy. I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, I'm an associate professor of organizational performance and workplace learning at Boise State University. We pronounce or we abbreviate organizational performance and workplace learning as OPAL because Idaho is the gem state. Uh, in the OPAL department, I teach our foundations course and the instructional design course. I've also taught courses in needs assessment and other areas. I provide pro bono consulting to nonprofit organizations and graduates. Uh, and in both our needs assessment and our instructional design courses, I coach students as they work with real clients to produce real world project deliverables. 
Before coming to Boise State, I was a performance consultant working with Deborah Stone and DLS Group, and that was almost 20 years. Uh, we created training project, projects. We conducted needs assessments and evaluations. We also built custom large-scale performance support systems uh, for regulators in the securities in industry, phone operators in high tech, analysts in national security. Um, we also conducted a large scale job and uh, cognitive task analysis investigating how detectives in California across the state conduct uh, criminal investigations. Um, and Rob and I are founders of the Process Management Lab. Uh, our colleagues and we work together with nonprofit organizations to help them improve their internal processes. We help them build capacity so that they can better meet their missions and serve their communities. Thank you, Steve. So that is a nice segue into the main event because what I wanted to talk to you about was this the process management lab. And so uh, I, I think you've worked out who's going to go first in answering this, but uh, so what is it and who's it for? Um, well, let me, let me throw this at you. Let's, uh, let's say it's a triangle and um, there's three, three points on that triangle. One of those points is, is it's process management lab. It's all about process management. We do process improvement. Uh, we help people learn processes. We help, you know, the training and all those pieces kind of go into it. Although the process improvement directly and re-engineering that is, is our kind of uh, key, key area. Um, the second area is nonprofit organizations. And we're particularly interested in helping them because that's what we want to do. Um, and so they're underserved and they need the capacity that we can provide. The third is um, that we have, that we involve students with what we're doing. And so we're essentially trying to apprentice um, uh, students and former students, graduates, um, uh, who can work with us to learn how to facilitate uh, process improvement, et cetera. And so we've spent the last two years as a small group working with a, with a statewide food bank. And now we're expanding our presence and we're working with a group of around 12 Opal students and graduates. And in addition to the food bank, we'll also be working with the Downtown Development Association for, uh, for Boise um, starting uh, in just a couple of weeks and uh, maybe even a nonprofit mental health services provider uh, back east later in the spring. So we wanna spread out geographically now that we have kind of broken the barriers of, of having to be in the same room at the same time. So across these efforts, we're looking to introduce students and graduates to real world opportunities and to practice process improvement in ways they'll benefit the nonprofit agencies and the communities, so. Thank you. Steve, is there anything you wish to add? Um, not to that particular piece, but I am ready for the next question. <laughs> All right, so so I did share the questions in advance here, but because it was with two of you here, you'd be talking over each other or I'd be interrupting you. But uh, so my, my next question is how does the, uh, workplace learning and performance fit into your approach to working with students to support clients as part of this process management lab. So uh, Rob kind of answered some, some of this, I think a little bit or touched on this, but uh, so how do the students prepare for this? What are they, what are they doing in this? Are you, you know, uh, coaching them as they go through this or are they pretty much on their own because they're at that stage, they're ready to, you know, go solo. Uh, we're using a variety of approaches. So um, because to our knowledge, no one has tried to do what we're doing in the project, uh, the process management lab. Uh, we're literally building the plane as we, we fly it. And so uh, in terms of the, how we're bringing students and graduates along, uh, they're involved as we're figuring this out as we go along. So they're involved with us 
in that uh, internally, uh, we need to ramp these people up. And the place where we're initially focusing our effort uh, is the creation of job aids, little micro learning objects. And so our, we have teams that are creating learning objects uh, that we can share with incoming new lab associates. Uh, we can also share with clients. We have another team that is creating learning objects, teaching uh, or representing how we use Mural to facilitate these uh, uh, process improvement uh, workshops with clients. We have another team that's creating marketing materials uh, because uh, we have to operate this like a consulting firm and we know one aspect of that is marketing. Uh, they've been, we're now starting our second semester in this large ramp up and our students have been uh, creating these materials. And what's great is uh, uh, we are our own user testing population. So as we, as teams create these, we're using them. So with the uh, materials describing what process uh, improvement is, uh, we immediately uh, did a tryout of those materials by sending them to new potential clients uh, in the hopes that they could self-select whether or not this was appropriate for their organization. Uh, the great news is that our minimally viable products were tests we wanted, and now we're in the marvelous place of tweaking them for a few more improvements. Um, we have a variety of assets uh, teaching people how to facilitate with Mural. Uh, we've reviewed them, uh, but there's some skepticism there because we have done this to the point where we kind of do it automatically. And we know that subject matter experts lie when they tell you what they do. So we've tried to be good about that. And our teams have tried to be good about that. But as we're going into these future workshops that Rob was talking about, uh, we're going to be testing those materials by using them together. Uh, and then for the uh, marketing, we're going to be testing that because our longer term goal is that all of our associates be able to sell the services of the process management lab. Ideally, we want demand for our services to far outstrip supply. And that means all of our associates will be uh, people potentially selling the lab. And that's uh, resulted in the creation of some additional marketing uh, materials explaining our approaches. Uh, but also uh, we're starting to create a shared uh, uh, customer relationship management system for want of a better term. So we can all contribute and coordinate our efforts and look at it in terms of business capture. Uh, we've started the initial conversations. Are those moving along in a way where we can foresee uh, being able to do some workshops or are we stalled or et cetera. So our students have been involved in creating all those assets uh, in an apprenticeship part of, part of the other issue yeah. that, there though, I got to throw in is that the fact is that we're both academics and we are pitiful at marketing. So, <laughs> so, so we're kind of help getting the students to help teach us a little bit more about how to do this effectively. And not just students, uh, but we have students and graduates, and it's nice uh, having this combined expertise working with us. You know, we're learning as much from them uh, as I think they might be learning from us. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in our uh, workshops, we're using an apprenticeship, uh, cognitive apprenticeship approach. So uh, we use a very detailed facilitator guide. Uh, which is nice because again, it's a job aid and it can ramp people up to be able to do parts of these uh, sessions. Uh, but we also use a lot of articulation and reflection. You know, here's what we're going to be doing. Here's what your role is going to be. After uh, the uh, session's over, we'll get together and we'll do a, a reflection debriefing uh, after action review kind of thing. And so we involve them in that as well. Um, and that's what we're doing kind of internally. We also think that as we create these uh, learning objects, our whole idea is to come out of uh, something both Rob and, and uh, 
my discipline share, which is the notion of modular design. So we're creating these little micro little modules, little ones about this big. Uh, and the idea is that we're going to be able to assemble those in different ways. So we are assembling them in you know, some configurations that are going to clients. We'll be configuring them in other configurations that will be uh, going for our lab associates. Uh, our longer term hope is to have a collection that's sufficient enough to create a course in uh, process improvement for our OPAL program and maybe others at Boise State. A couple of questions. Uh, so you talk about the, the, the various teams. Are people rotating across these teams so that you know everybody gets a chance to do a little of the marketing kinds of things and and uh, um, working with the, with the process mapping kinds of uh, uh, aspects? Uh, uh, probably um, not as much. Uh, there will be more of that. Um, we're right now we're on our second sprint. Mm -hmm. um, so the that that first sprint, um, you know, people were working in one set of teams. There's been a little adjustment to that after Christmas. Some people uh, coming back, other people having to to move off in other directions. So, mm -hmm. so um, yeah. So there's been a little bit of mix up and a little bit of continuity. Yeah. Well, um, so finishing things up. There are uh, two uh, act activity streams going on in the lab. So the first activity stream is uh, internal and building all the little objects that we're gonna need to function. Uh, the second activity stream are the workshops. And uh, we are intentionally looking at, uh, from the get-go at rotating people through the workshops. And the idea is, uh, one of our driving metaphors is that of a community of practice where anyone who is legitimately interested in what we do can be part of the lab and, and be part of participating in the workshops. So we have uh, students who are very early in their program who are going to be assisting us in these upcoming workshops. Uh, we also have people that really like doing this. And of course, over time, they get better at it. And so uh, we're trying to find a sweet spot where in addition to Rob and me, we have at least one other experienced person on these teams, and then we're rotating in two uh, to three other people and starting to build that experience. Because at some point, you know, we've considered scaling up, uh, but right now Rob and I are the bottlenecks to that scaling. And so we're growing the talent base so that all of the workshops don't have to have both Rob and Steve or even a Rob or a Steve. You say workshops, you're really talking about analysis workshops with the client and their people and design and development, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, well, typically, a, if, if you take, uh, if we're going to work on one process, let's say they've got, um, they've got problems with their receiving process. And um, so that's, that generally is going to take two workshops, about five hours a piece, it will be, there'll be maybe five to 10 participants from the organization who, um, who man or, or who person uh, fill in uh, various parts of that process or hands-on hands -on knowledge. And, um, and then there'll be uh, probably three, three um, minimum of three facilitators. One is a technographer, one is a facilitator uh, working the discussion. And then the third is we call the color commentator, uh, but is kind of looking, looking broadly, looking for other, um, um, other anomalies, et cetera, to bring up it or to prompt, uh, to help prompt the, the group. So let me add, you and mentioned uh, the tool, I think, but are you using kind of a swim lane uh, process mapping or what, what are you documenting? What, what, how would you describe the, the documentation of the process? The, in the first workshop, we focus on um, the process as it is. And right. in representing that, uh, we let the nature of the process guide how we represent it. So there are times where processes uh, cut across multiple people simultaneously. And in those cases, we'll do some swim lane stuff. Uh, 
In other situations, what we're talking about is one group or one team concentrating on one activity, and it exists in this kind of time space uh, relative to the rest of the process. Uh, once we have mapped out that as is process, we will then ask participants to come back and tell us or identify disconnects in the process. Uh, disconnects is a work is a word that works well with participants. Uh, we also call them pain points. Uh, to people in the performance improvement world, those are uh, associated performance gaps, big differences between what we wanna be able to do and what we're actually doing. Uh, and uh, we'll then work together to prioritize those disconnects. Uh, there's a report that goes out that everyone afterwards gets to review. And if we need to you know, make some emergency changes, we can. In the next meeting called the 2B workshop, uh, what we focus on is first you know, reviewing what we did before, but then for each one of those uh, disconnects and especially the prioritized ones, we start looking at solutions. So Rob started mentioned that color commentator. Uh, when Rob does color commentary, as people start talking about disconnects and solutions, he's bringing his IT background in that. So, you know, uh, should people be doing this? Uh, what's, you know, are they using shadow systems when their software should be better? Uh, should we be doing this at all? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it, color commentary based on a performance improvement mindset. Uh, wow, are there barriers in the environment here that are getting in the way? Are they trying to use individual fixes to fix what should be done in the environment? Uh, do people really have the skills to do this? Or are they being asked to do so many things at once that they're real capacity issues? So um, the color commentator will go across both of these workshops. In the 2B workshop, we'll review the maps, the disconnects, and we'll also specify solutions. And then, uh, because we're not just, you know, here's your process map and report, we're done. Uh, we want that long-term relationship because we wanna help the organization affect the change. And so we're with them uh, in our workshop to begin addressing implementation issues. Uh, and so we will have prioritized the pain points, we have prioritized the solutions. And then for the highest value solutions, we begin mapping out the implementation stages. Yep. All of that goes into presentations that process owners then start taking to leadership. And that process now has become institutionalized where every few weeks our process leads are meeting with uh, leadership, for example, in the food bank, and they're saying, we're working on these processes. Here's where we are today. Uh, uh, here are any barriers getting in the way and what we need from you. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really, uh, and in the background, we're working with process leads and executives uh, to address the pain, uh, the, the uh, change support issues. Uh, because we know this doesn't matter until they are affecting changes in the organization. Rob, I spoke too much. What did you, I'm sure you <laughs> went to this. No, you spoke, you spoke very well, Steve. I mean, yeah, all of that. Um, I, I think you put it, put it really well. We're, we're seeing a lot of, you know, each process were a set of workshops there. It really, it winds up where we take it to a high level of prioritization uh, of what are the, you know, there might be 30 or 40 solutions that get, that get brainstormed there. And then we're gonna take those and, and sort and, and prioritize. And there's gonna be a few which are gonna be the cream that are gonna rise up to the top. And then we'll, we'll take those, get some implementation ideas and plans and move that. We, we call all that prioritization. We have, this is trademarked. So, so I just wanna make sure you understand that. But, but because Steve is a big wrestling fan, uh, we call that the battle royale. You know, when you, you take all the winners and you throw them in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the area to, to fight one another and the best ones come out to the top. And then, and then we help, and then we work with that uh, team lead usually to create a presentation. And we've developed a kind of a format 
for them to present their top ideas and what's what's it going to take to do those to lead leadership. So we're actually take trying to take it out of the, you know, move that solution, those solutions out of the, um, the team room um, and into the uh, boardroom where they can get the um, where they can get the support and the, the resources they need to to be able to move forward with and set the expectations. So, so that's been real successful. And we've, and as Steve mentioned, you know, we've seen a, a number of, of um, changes happening in the organization, um, kind of that have been spinning from that, uh, that, and it's, and it's changing a lot of the expectations and uh, how people are working together on, on just a daily basis. Very cool. Uh, so so the, the, that was kind of a nice segue into my next question, which is about, you know, so what kind of measurable impacts are you having? So I'm going to guess that as you're looking at all the so potential solutions, you're comparing what the value of the problem is, the worth of the problem, the cost of nonconformance is what the quality world might call it, or the performance improvement potential is what Tom Gilbert would have called it in the HPT, human performance technology sense. So you're really kind of looking at what's what's the uh, return on the investment going to be and what's the investment cost? Are you looking at ROI? Are you kind of being predictive in terms of, to help with the prioritization and then measuring success against that? Oh, not at all, Guy. Not at all. Uh, we can't, not. It's hard to get to ROI when they don't have measures in place uh, okay. for the most part. And so we're kind of kind of greenfield a little bit there, but it's coming along. I'll let Steve talk about that. Yeah. yeah. So in our workshops where people pose solutions, uh, we informally address uh, what is the ratio between the level of expected effort and benefit for each one of those solutions. And uh, that's done, you know, based on what people in the workshop know, I understand, but uh, that is one of the indicators that we use for prioritizing uh, the solutions that will be presented to management. So those kinds of things are on our minds. But as Rob said, we have to meet clients where they are. So uh, with uh, one of our workshops, uh, we have a process lead who uh, was, is really, really a genius at uh, what he does. Um, uh, because this is a food bank, you know, this person was also really good at working in the, the uh, warehouse. This person uh, had uh, never addressed a group of the organization's leaders before. And so one of the things that uh, one of our members uh, provided was, uh, you know, professional presentation coaching services. Um, but we do have a set of some tangible and intangible results that we're monitoring. So, uh, in terms of the tangible side, we know that uh, we have reduced uh, uh, spoilage cost over the last several months from a high of 93,000 to $250 over the last uh, four months. And we also know that uh, these efforts have produced a 30% reduction in receiving errors. Uh, and that's really important because if you uh, get the errors out of the way early in the process. They don't come back to bite you uh, later. Uh, and those figures came from their uh, chief operating officer. Uh, now, the other thing is in the future, uh, we're hoping that they're going to be interested in conducting a formal program evaluation as more of these uh, things get done. Uh, and Opal has an evaluation course that needs projects. So that might be a nice uh, uh, synchro synchronicity there. Uh, but the client now is also uh, at a point where they're starting to think about what should our dashboard be? And they want our uh, input on that. And so this is a really neat space uh, of going from uh, the process work to trying to see that implemented in terms of uh, implementation and culture change. So uh, with that, you know, we're hoping to see one of the parts of the dashboard being uh, what's the status of the pain points and the solutions. 
Uh, we're also hoping to see the emergence of really good metrics. And we have a workshop uh, plan now for March that's going to start looking at uh, revisiting the processes we've mapped out in a process improvement mindset, and now looking more at process re-engineering. So for each one of those processes, uh, do we really need that step? And if we need it, what are the metrics that should be there? And if something isn't, going, isn't getting done, how do we alarm? So that instead of waiting for things and checking that things are done late in the process, we're doing them on time. Uh, and that's exciting. Uh, that's going to be a, we're going to take a very different frame with that one. Whereas we've been kind of working through mapping the processes from the start to the finish and identifying uh, disconnects and solutions and prioritizing those. A lot of that has been, um, I would say, low hanging fruit is that, that what, what the participants have been picking off there. Now we're going to take those same maps and we're gonna work backwards. So as Steve said, okay, we have problems at the end of this process. Where did that process originate? And then we'll actually, uh, we can get kind of, I think deeper into changing the processes uh, that were going on there. Mm -hmm. And this will be also in, they, they have not quite uh, made it to the point of barcoding which for a warehouse-based type of operation is, is a huge, uh, huge change and a very fundamental shift uh, to um, a lot of elements to how they organize and work. So that will be, um, so this will be kind of uh, backing us into their ability to, to uh, make those much larger fundamental changes. The other returns we're seeing are uh, intangible, and I think they'd be more in line with the stuff that uh, uh, Bob Carlton and Claude Limeberry and Toasty would talk about in terms of, are we seeing changes in organizational culture? And intangibly, what we know is, is that they're getting this process improvement stuff and they're valuing it. We know that because uh, their COO is telling us that uh, these people are becoming uh, increasingly skilled and they now are coming in and saying, hey, we've got a process problem here. It used to be, I got a problem with Bob or I got a problem with Pat. And they used to be personal problems. Now people are coming into leadership and saying, we've got a process problem and they've been using what we've done at, in this uh, larger scale at smaller scales to address smaller issues. Uh, and what they found is because people are coming in and being involved in these, uh, people have buy-in uh, for the solutions. It's not about management trying to force workers to get things done. It's all of us are together. And how are we going to engineer what we do in ways that serve our mission and meet the needs of the community? So when, when I, uh, I want to just cap this off. I know we're running out of time. So to cap this off, and one of the comments that was made, which I just I just loved, I, I, I fell down when I heard this, it was that, that process improvement and involving the people who are actually doing the job and coming up with solutions and bringing that up and down to leadership, process improvement is breaking down the carpet to concrete barrier between leadership and warehouse personnel. Um, just, I just, I, that just summed it all up. That's a great uh, phrase. Um, I, I, I like that. Um, let me go to my next question now. If you have an example that you can share uh, about this, we've been kind of talking through an example, but do you have another example where you can talk about uh, what, what you've accomplished here in the uh, process management lab? Um, yeah, we'd like to talk about how we completely revamped how we go about uh, process management. When we first started our process management work, we were using a traditional in-person facilitation approach. And I know you've done this, Guy. Uh, we go to the client <laughs> site and we use one of their meeting rooms. Um, there are never enough whiteboards. So we start hanging butcher paper all around the wall. Uh, we come in with shopping bags or boxes filled with uh, sticky notes and, and little kitty sticker stickers that people use to vote on what's important and so on. Um, 
we uh, conduct the workshop meeting in person with participants. And interestingly, um, if you're working with a larger organization, there are going to be people involved in the process that may not be there in person in the workshop. And we kind of kid ourselves by saying, oh, we've got this pricey phone system. And there, there's a main phone console that looks very nice. And there's some satellite uh, microphones in the room. And supposedly, they're able to participate in that workshop because we've got these phone hookups. Uh, and that's how we expected uh, to continue working. And that just creates a have and have versus have not group because most of it is all in the visual that you're building around the room, you know? So the poor people on the telephone are just at a major dis disadvantage, but, but that wasn't what stopped us actually. What stopped <laughs> us was COVID. Yeah. And uh, so this is even pre Delta. So this was like, uh, we did our first one in paper and pencil. And then, the, then, then here comes the paper and Sharpie. And then the, uh, then, then along came COVID. So we spent uh, some months, uh, about four or five months, kind of working with one of our associates uh, in testing out different tools, uh, kind of group whiteboarding tools uh, that we could use to do the mapping, to use, use for the facilitation, et cetera, so that we could facilitate the process improvement workshops remotely. And um, so that was, uh, we looked at Mural and Miro and Lucid and, and, um, and we mapped the creation of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches as a proof of concept. You know, we had that process down like that. And we, um, and finally we got to, uh, with Mural, I think we found what we were looking for not perfect, but it actually it's, it's very strong and it has some, um, some strong facilitation uh, management uh, tools, crowd management tools in it. So, so we, um, we uh, created some process improvement mural boards, kind of our own templates um, and beefed up the facilitator guides to be able to work with uh, mural there. And, uh, and then we started off. And so we've done about a half dozen of those uh, with, uh, with Mural, and, and that's really a wonderful way to go. We're really looking for it, and, and the nice thing, it's wonderful because we've got 100% uh, participation from everybody um, and around the entire state because there's multiple sites um, around Idaho. So anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of what we're doing there. We use Mural and, and Zoom together. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, mostly the mural tools there. And then we take it out of mural at the end and uh, we massage that information into reports, distribute those more traditional ways. This and, is extremely interesting to me because uh, back in 1989, my client AT&T, which had telecommunication rooms where they could link everybody across North America and Europe and they had me facilitate uh, an update to a curriculum architecture design that I had done. So I had all this performance data, all the enabling knowledge and skills data, and we were you know, projecting it and the cameras were on it and everybody theoretically could see it. But I always felt that no one could get close enough to see the data. And it, it is such a visual thing that you know they got to look at it, think about it, confirm it, Re reject it and modify it or whatever to really buy into it. Otherwise, it's all kind of a blur. And uh, so I'm, I'm particularly interested in, you know, what tools are you uh, using to do the, the online? I hope that there's videos that you guys will produce to show snippets of some of your work, you know, to the outside world, you know, maybe it'll attract some new students to Boise and your program. But, uh, but anyway, so. Yeah. Something we need to do is put together those, and, and we have that kind of on the uh, on our list, but uh, yeah, putting together some snippets so that uh, somebody can see, kind of watch the watch the whole process unfold there. Yeah, uh, and you know the other the other piece there that's important is that every individual has their own computer, has their own keyboard, 
That means they can move around this infinite whiteboard space so they can look at different parts of the model if they wish. At the same time, they can also, we can also have them entering in brainstorming ideas about disconnects or solutions or votes or whatever else. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the trick. You get past the production blocking uh, of one person being able to talk at one time. And, um, and then you can kind of unleash that. And then you bring everybody back together and let's look at this and let's explore the meeting, et cetera. So, sorry. And Excellent. we now have a more diverse and inclusive approach. Uh, you know, we started this uh, part of the conversation talking about those poor people who were trying to participate in an in-person workshop, you know, given only, you know, a phone connection that, you know, you might not be able to hear everything on anyway. No. Uh, we now have a way so that our clients can in reach out and include everyone who needs to be participating and we all participate e equally. Now we're participating in like the little square boxes that you see in the Muppet Show, but everyone has a voice. And uh, as you were talking about, Guy, and as Rob mentioned, everyone's involved now in this process. So they're involved as we're mapping out the process. They're involved in uh, providing ratings of how critical is this disconnect or what's the ratio of... Uh, effort to benefit of this solution. Uh, they are involved in uh, specifying implementation steps. They are involved in voting on what the priorities are. And after we have a vote, they're involved in the sense making of the vote. So, you know, well, here are the things that you said were really important. How does this resonate with you? Uh, oh, these things, you know, all ranked highly. Are these all things that are related or not? And they talk through these things. And so uh, in making this more accessible and more diverse with more different people and more inclusive with more different people, uh, what we've done is uh, two things. We've jump-started the buy-in and the change uh, support process. Uh, we've also uh, improved the quality of the process management approach itself, because we've all done things like this before. And we know whether we call ourselves the process management lab, or we call ourselves performance improvement people, if you don't have the right people in the room, you're going to spend a lot of time on these facilitation activities, and you're going to create things that just look really nice. They're going to be pretty, and the reports are going to be professional. Uh, but if you don't have all the people in the room and all that shared expertise and all that ability to reach consensus uh, and, and to make decisions, then you're essentially wasting clients' time and money. You know, you might be going through the motions, but you're not going to be preparing something that is actually going to be representing, uh, providing a complete, accurate, authentic representation uh, of the, the, the process, let alone uh, have something that's going to uh, hold together during the orphans of our performance improvement process, which we all know are implementation and change support. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so critical to get, you know, you know, so-called the right people on the bus to do the right things at the right time. And that's always been critical. I always, I always uh, strove to uh, get my client, whoever requested me to come in and do work, to form a project steering team of all the stakeholders and have them handpick the people that I would use in analysis and design, because if I brought back bad news in their view, you know, this is what's broken. This is what's not, you know, you don't need training or you need training, but you first got to do this and do this, and do this. Mm -hmm. They, they would, they couldn't reject it. If I was not the, uh, if I was just the messenger, they could kill the messenger, me in the meetings, but, but they couldn't dispute the data because it came from their handpicked experts, people that they trusted. Um, and, you know, so, but so then it's the, the goal is to get all those right people there and not have, you know, outliers come in and cherry pick things and then didn't understand, you know, why did it get worded that way? And what, you know, what were the, exactly. what did you skip? That's critical, but, and getting the buy-in from the client. So once you well, have these successes, I would imagine that that just leads to everybody really buying into the whole process and approach, mm -hmm. getting the right people into the room. 
And uh, the other thing is, uh, this is an educational undertaking and Rob and I can pull the professor card. Uh, which can be really helpful. And when we're qualifying projects with potential clients, uh, part of the pitch it, it gets to sponsorship because we will not form these partnerships or do this work without adequate uh, sponsorship. And we carefully explain to clients that sponsorship uh, is both from the top down and the bottom up. So from the top down, uh, we want approval from the executive committee. We wanna be working with their leadership team uh, we may or may not be directly uh, working with their board. Uh, in terms of bottom up, uh, we want to make sure that all those right people are on the bus. Uh, and it's important to have both of those. If you don't have top down, uh, yeah. change will stall with inertia. If you don't have bottom up, people will sabotage stuff that they don't believe in or they won't adopt it. They may not uh, choose to sa actively sabotage it, but you know they are not going to have their heart in their head in making those changes. And so, um, because this is an educational undertaking, um, we can rig the game, and we rig the game to make sure we have adequate sponsorship, and we rig the game with the single rule of everyone has to win. We will not approach this stuff unless it's good for the nonprofit. It's good for the community they serve. Uh, and it's good for the leadership of the nonprofit, the executives, the board, the people doing the work. Uh, it's good for Boise State. It's good for the people in our lab. And if we find something where somebody isn't winning, uh, we have the luxury of spending a little more time to negotiate until we find that sweet spot. Or we have the luxury of walking away. Uh, now, uh, so far, you know, we haven't had to do that, but we think it's the quality of the initial sprint materials that we're trying out now uh, that's helping clients self-select knowing that they need to meet this sponsorship responsibility. Because as you mentioned, Guy, without that sponsorship and without that involvement, um, all we are are external consultants that think they know too much. Yeah. I mean, you bring in a huge report and nobody has the time to absorb it unless they were brought along on the journey. And so that's that's so critical. Yeah. But let's shift exactly. back to the students that you have and some of the people that have already graduated from your program. They're coming in. They're participating in this. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're hey, looking what, what are some of the testimonials that you've heard from them? Uh, well, the first uh, is that we are now on our second semester of doing this. Uh, and in both semesters, we've had a collection of Opal graduates and students, uh, and most of them came back. And when people couldn't come back, they're telling us two things. One, I'll be back later. And they're saying, I can't be there now because I've started a new job, or I can't be there right now uh, because I'm having a baby. Uh, I can't be there now because uh, I've got a heavy coursework load but they're always telling us I will be back. And so that's really cool. Uh, it's cool for students because uh, one of our other metaphors is that we are, uh, we are consultants and we're running a consulting shop. We're running a consultancy. Um, and in this consultancy, we're not their teachers. This is not a class. We are working together to help serve these nonprofits so they can serve their communities. And that's working really well. Uh, and for our students, it's a way to get real world experience. So uh, our one of our initial associate uh, mm -hmm. has worked with us on a number of labs, uh, a number of workshops. She took some time off because she's now starting her dream job at Boise State working with their process improvement folks. And she used her work at the process management lab, not only to get that job, but in her portfolio uh, review. And so we see it being really good for, for students. We think it's good for graduates because it keeps them connected to this um, community. But what we're trying, what we're testing out is this notion that we can be a, the safest place around for stretch assignments uh, because this is happening in a non-threatening and very supportive work environment. Um, we know that some organizations are really good at setting up stretch assignments where uh, people have the support they need to deliver a success story. 
And if some things don't pan out the way everyone wants, it's going to be okay. You know, no one, it's not going to haunt you the rest of your, your time in that job. Um, my suspicion is that those organizations are few and far between. I think in a lot of organizations, uh, stretch assignments can be kind of dangerous. Um, and this is really important for our workshops because if you opt as an associate to help us create our internal learning objects, uh, the commitment there is uh, a total of 45 hours over a semester, but you do it in three sprints and each sprint commi commitment is between 10 and 15 hours. And so, um, and we won't ever ask you to spend more time on things. We're using an agile approach where we're actively time boxing what people are doing. Uh, and so that's worked really well. Uh, one of the challenges we're confronting now is, is if you want to do these workshops with us, it's a different beast because it's client facing. Yeah. And the commitment there is around 27, 30 hours for you know, this set of workshops and all of its attendant work. Uh, that's a big ask for people. Um, these uh, students uh, and graduates are already juggling a whole bunch of stuff. And on top of that, they're wanting to, uh, you know, do work with the process management lab. Uh, and so what we're hoping that we can pull off and what we're discussing with our lab associates in uh, uh, our uh, sprint planning meetings this uh, week was uh, if you think it would be helpful, go to your boss and uh, present this as a stretch assignment. And Rob and I will pull out our little professor wands and write the uh, appropriate you know, letters and documentation. Uh, and we're seeing if we might be able to get the release time for our graduates to participate more in this because we strongly suspect that when people said, yeah, I wanna work with the process management lab, uh, what really got them was the notion that they'd be able to work directly with these nonprofit organizations, helping them improve process, not necessarily you know, being part of the internal operations that create these enabling uh, learning objects for the lab and its clients. Yeah. But, you know, uh, that's part of uh, building and flying the plane at the same time. Uh, we're hoping mm -hmm. this uh, uh, stretch assignment uh, rationale finds some traction with people's managers. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so is there, is there, besides the video that we we're just doing, is there any write-ups on this where people who are interested in this can go someplace and, uh, um, you know, read up on it or, or listen to podcasts or whatever you guys have got. Uh, we, got. we have a website and we will provide the URL to you. So you can include that in uh, your post of our uh, conversation. Uh, and in that uh, we outline our approach and um, our business model, our service model, our works to date. Uh, we'll also uh, provide um, three short PDFs that describe uh, what uh, process improvement is, how our workshops operate, uh, and how to um, select people to participate in the workshops. And there'll so be a number of, we have a number of more pieces that will be coming up mm -hmm. on there as we get them completed. Over the yeah, the site years. is so under uh, perpetual construction. <laughs> of course, of course. But this is available to people outside of Boise State and the program. And yes. that's, that's what's good. So people can get a, a bird's eye view of what this is all about. And, you know, you may even attract some additional uh, students to the program, I would imagine, because I've not heard of, you know, you hear about people doing projects and things like that, but the uh, but, I, but, you know, I think that the, the technology that you're using and your process and performance orientation, I think, is critical. You know, I always love the idea of the merging of the of TQM and uh, HPT and have mm -hmm. process orientation. Because that's what I learned from Rumler, you know, the guy that invented the, uh, the uh, as is to be phrase. <laughs> Alan Ramis, my, one of my former co-workers at Motorola, but... Uh, 
but he credits uh, Gary for uh, 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 creating that. It's in documentation that I have from 1981 from Rumler too. But um, right. what well, is there? What else can we? What else would you add to this as as we wrap up? Rob, what do you got to say? I just um, I don't know. I'm just having a good time. Uh, <laughs> we're we're incredibly lucky, and in, uh, this uh, kind of back to this triangle. Um, I, I love working with processes because they're 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 complex and they're messy, and they are um, and uh, but they live very closely within people, uh, within the processes that we work. We get to know them very well. We have a lot of ownership over, over, with them, and being able to work with people who care very deeply, um, you know, about that is great. The nonprofit, um, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're not, we're in our twilight years, uh, guy. You know, we we don't have to make a living, right? With the things that we're doing, we're we're trying to help others live, and that's that's um, what this is all about. So so I, you know, I love giving back and and being able to give back from the skill set that I've developed over the years is is wonderful. Um, and working with students, you know, it's, it's been a few years that I've been retired and mostly I've been working with my own, um, my own software that I, that I sell to universities, um, on teamwork. But, um, so this is, um, just working directly with students again and, uh, and, and graduates, uh, is wonderful is, um, you know, they they bring all that energy and excitement and, learning new things and wanting to try new things. And oh God, it's fantastic. Yeah. I miss it. <laughs> yeah, we're just incredibly lucky uh, to steal from Conan O'Brien. We get to work with the, pe the folks we love and we get to work doing things we love doing. Uh, we get to work on projects where everybody wins and we get to do things that matter. Life is good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just add one thing here is that I was visiting uh, Gary Rumler back in 1999 and he had this big number four on a big uh, whiteboard uh, off in the corner there. And after two days of meeting with him, I said, what the hell is that four all about? And he said, life is one in the fourth quarter. So the, the life is one, the game is one in the fourth quarter. And that's uh, for all that. and it's more about giving back. And that's what he was all into. I appreciate what you guys are saying because um, you want to help that next, uh, those next generations coming along and help steer them right because our world is fraught with uh, foo-foo or snake oil or whatever you want to call it. And there are proven methods out there um, that, are evolving because of the technology. And that's what's, I think, so wonderful about uh, all of this. Yeah. And thank yeah. you so much for, for doing this video. I Maybe we can do another one after another couple of semesters have gone by or something and catch up and see what, what is new in all of this. Steve, we've known each other for 30 years since 1989, and it's been a long time. And I really appreciate uh, everything that that you've done in our profession and uh, giving back so much as you have um, and doing this work with the students. I really love that. Rob, it was really nice mm. to meet you and uh, hear your Nice story. to meet you. And, and thank uh, you, Gary. Thank you, Guy, for, for what you're doing. I mean, uh, this is great, kind of capturing different people's perspectives on the world and, uh, and, uh, and sharing those. Fantastic. Yeah, we can't if, if, wait to share this conversation with others. Yeah. Well, if Boise State has a journalism department or something, you need to get a camera crew to follow you guys around the entire <laughs> semester and then boil it down to oh. a reasonable like 30 hours or something. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Does that mean I'm going to have to put pants on? You know. <laughs> well, you know, pants are optional, but only... Okay. Okay. Yeah. Up, um, <laughs> if, that's, if that's what they're shooting. Anyway, I'll let you guys go and thank you so much. And uh, send me the URLs. And I'll put those in the show notes in the YouTube video and in the blog post, which I'm going to put up on Sunday. You guys great. have a great day. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you, Guy. All right. Thanks, Guy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.